My name is Nathan McCree. I've been a uh, composer and sound designer for video games since uh, 1993, I believe. So what's that? That's 20, 24 years, something like that. Um, I've worked on and, and had published over 60 computer games now. Uh, the most prolific being probably Tomb Raider 1, 2 and 3 and Silent Hill Downpour. Um, I've also worked in other audio industries, TV, film and music industries and I did end up writing some music for the Spice Girls back in 1999. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting career so far. Um, I think I was about 13 when I started uh, when I got the bug to start writing music. Um, I just got into electronic bands of the time um, and I was really interested in synthesizers and the sounds that they could make. So I badgered my dad quite a lot to get to buy me a synthesizer for my birthday. But he kept he kept saying no because he wanted me to concentrate on my piano playing and you know become a good pianist. And he thought that if I was playing a synthesizer I wouldn't develop good playing techniques so he was always against it and thought that you know that I would sort of forget about my piano but I kept going on at him about it and eventually he did he bought me um, a Korg Delta which is a really kind of well old now an old analog synthesizer which didn't have any memory presets on it so I used to make sounds some string sound or whatever or something that I liked and then I was borrowing stealing borrowing his uh, reel to reel multi-track recorder and I'd be recording some part on there and then if I had to change the sound I literally had to change all the faders and get the sound that I'd made earlier so I literally had to remember where all the faders were to create the sound that I created a few days ago or something so it's a real laborious process but it really taught me about sound design and and um, and how synthesizers work I guess so that that was the thing that I guess sparked my interest and after that, I just started writing track after track after track. I wanted to leave school at 16 and just be in a band. You know, just do the rock and roll thing, go on tour, blah, 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 blah. And my dad was like, absolutely no way. You know, so he said, you've got to go and do A-levels, you've got to go and do a degree and get something solid to, you know, to earn a living from. And music wasn't really... Um, it didn't provide a kind of stable salary yeah. so I chose to do something which I could guarantee to get work from guarantee to get a salary and computers computer games was my next main interest so I thought well you know I'll go into coding I went to university in Kingston in London and uh, when I finished my degree um, you know I didn't really have a, um, a decision as to where I wanted to be apart from with my girlfriend who lived in Derby. Ah. So I just said, well look, I've finished my degree course, you've still got a couple of years to go, I'll come up and hang out with you yeah. and you know, look for a job in Derby. So that's what happened. Ah. Um, that's very different yeah, so I just, I literally I went through the yellow pages and wrote to every software company I could find in the Derbyshire area and core design were the I think the only ones which called me in for an interview and I got the job straight away so it was really quite fortunate. I didn't even know they were a games company. <laughs> I just thought yeah I'll just get a job, anything will do for now, you know, just get some money in my pocket. Wow. And I was like, do you, do you make games here then? They were like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what we do. I'm like, oh, bonus. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I first started in the industry, um, the consoles were chip, chip based consoles, so there were no CDs. So all the sounds that it made came from a little Yamaha chip about this big, which is actually quite big in terms of chips these days. Um, so, and, and there was no sequencing software like Cubase or Pro Tools or anything like that. So we literally had to code our own music sequencer for the, for the Mega Drive. So because my degree was actually in software engineering, um, I teamed up with another programmer at Core Design and together we designed and wrote this music sequencer for the Mega Drive. But it, it didn't look anything like these things now. It looked a bit more like a fruit machine. 
So we had six reels which spin, basically. On, an e on, an, on each reel, you've got like, say, 64 slots. And each slot is like a quantized tick of an eight bar pattern. So I've got 64 ticks in my eight bar pattern, okay. So I've got eight ticks per bar, right? I think if my maths is right. Um, so for each beat, you know, if I've got eight ticks rolling by, um, you know, I can then put notes on each tick. And each reel is like one voice. So I've got six voices, 64 ticks per bar. And so off you go, you start plugging in the notes and it's literally on a QWERTY keyboard. None, none of this stuff. Okay, so we've mapped out a little, you know, C to C octave on the QWERTY keyboard and I'm plugging in these notes. And then we've got special commands which we, which we can add in there like vibrato or volume controls, stuff like this. Um, so you've got all these things flying by when you press play. <laughs> you can see all the notes going by and you can see where the gaps are where nothing is playing. So you just keep adding stuff, trying to fill in the gaps to make it, you know, as full as possible. And this was effectively chip music. Um, the annoying blippy bloppy stuff that everyone goes, oh, not computer game music, all that blippy bloppy stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's effectively what it was. And that's where you get those characteristic sounds from those arpeggiated chords going because we couldn't play many notes simultaneously, you know, so you had to sort of arpeggiate it to sort of simulate chords and stuff. So that was really the kind of principle behind how it worked. Um, and of course we had to generate sound effects for the game as well using that same system. So one of those six channels was dedicated only to sound effects. Um, and of course we can only play one sound effect at once. Um, so yeah, pretty limited system, but yeah, taught me a lot. So, you know, we've got this chip-based system which plays six notes simultaneously. And then suddenly we've got a CD console where we can put on a full live orchestra if we want to, or some uh, techno band or some dance music, or, you know, suddenly we were competing with the rock and pop bands of the time um, and all the orchestras that were out there. and. Yeah, it was a big sort of gulp in your throat. It was like, mm. oh my God, you know, we've got to up our game. Yeah. Um, so then we started using, you know, these machines, the sort of big synthesizers and keyboards that were able to uh, make some pretty decent orchestral sounds. Um, the producer came down and he said, okay, we need some music for Soul Star. And I'm like, okay. He said, we want basically some John Williams Star Wars music. And I'm like, yeah, right, you know, start at the top, why don't you? You know, it's like, okay, suddenly I've got to try and compete with that, you know, one of the best in Hollywood, you know. So that was a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, and, I, and, and I remember the brass sounds that I had on, on those keyboards wasn't very good. And I ended up using, like, sawtooth waves, and stuff like that, real kind of synthesizer sounds, but I had them sort of buried in the mix quite a bit so that they sounded like a brass section, as long as I didn't leave them exposed too much, you know, as long as loads of other stuff going on, it sort of filled that part of the ensemble, if you like. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I got to work on Soul Star. I listened to a lot of the music on Aliens um, because we wanted something that was quite dramatic. And you're in a spaceship and you're basically just blasting away. It was a, a 3D blaster. So you didn't really need to think too much. You just needed to pound your thumb against the fire button, you know, and just keep it out of the way of anything else. So, um, yeah, lots, lots of sort of busy action music for that. Um, and we, we got nominated for Best Computer Game Music 1994. Oh, wow. We didn't win it. I'll tell you who won it. It was a game called Rebel Assault, which licensed John Williams Star Wars music. Oh, okay. So I was like, ah, that's not fair competition. But anyway, it was good to be in the same um, category, I suppose, as John Williams. It was quite nice. Um, well, I, I spoke to Toby Gard, who was the original designer. Um, 
as with any game that I was working on at Core Design, uh, when I finished one, I was immediately talking to the designer on the next game, and we were talking about what music they wanted and this kind of thing. Um, so I had a chat with Toby, and it was pretty clear that he wanted he wanted something cinematic. Um, so my immediate thought was orchestral music for that, um, and we talked about the places that she went to, what she was like as a character, um, how the game moved from one area to the other, um, was that we were going to have a level which you played, and then there'd be a sort of video sequence which linked the end of this level to her yeah. arriving in Egypt or wherever. So, you know, there'll be some little story. She gets on a boat, you know, there's a black screen, and then she arrives in Egypt, you know, this kind of thing. So. Once I then understood the kind of structure of the game and how it works, it's basically like a movie with levels where you can sort of roam around and do whatever you want, and then you get another little joiner, and then another level where you can roll around, and then eventually you get to the end. So the whole thing was like a movie. We just needed to work out how to script the music for the actual levels where you can just sort of roam around freely. The rest of it was really simple. It was just video sequences. So that's dead easy. That's just like writing music for videos, uh, music for, for movies. So the in-game stuff was more difficult. Um, but what was apparent to me with Tomb Raider was because of this sort of free roaming world, um, the, the, it, w it was going to be wrong if we just filled that with music. You know, the, the whole point about the game was that it was a puzzle game without any clues. Um, and so you literally walked into a room and you had to work out what you were supposed to do. So there was going to be a lot of thinking, a lot of wondering, a lot of looking, a lot of searching. And th the last thing I wanted people to do was to go, for God's sake, turn that bloody music off. You know, I didn't want that. So I thought, well, best to just give them little bits, um, little bits every now and again for when something really important happens. So that's, that was my main direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we talked about earlier about giving the player um, thinking time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of time to think in Tomb Raider. Yeah. So um, I thought, well, rather than just keep music playing all the time, let's just bring them into the atmosphere completely and just have no music. And they would just be wandering around with the sort of real world sounds that were happening around them. Yeah. Um, plus the fact I only had three weeks to write all the music and it wasn't really a long time to write a lot of music. So it kind of worked in my favor as well, you know. Um, so I just wrote a, a, um, a number of tunes which I thought might be useful. There was an action tune, there were a couple of sort of safe area tunes. Um, but I wanted to try and bring in some more emotional content, which I felt wasn't really apparent in any game up to that point. Yeah. So I wanted to describe a bit more about how Lara felt, um, you know, her, her perhaps loneliness, some sadness, and people get killed around her, this kind of thing. Um, uh, perhaps some sort of fondness of her thinking about home. Um, that sort of feeling you get when you're up on a high ledge and you're a bit nervous about looking down. Stuff like that, you know. I just wanted to try and get the player to feel what she felt, I suppose. So, yeah, I, I, I just started writing that sort of emotional content. And then when it came to placing the music in the game, for the first one, that was pretty much out of my hands. I think Toby actually put in the triggers for the music. Um, it, it, it wasn't how I would have done it, um, but it worked. People, people seemed to enjoy Tomb Raider 1. Tomb Raider 2, I was definitely involved with the programming of the music triggers on that. And we started to develop the music a little bit more, had a bit more time, I think eight weeks for Tomb Raider 2. A little bit better, um, and so I started making it more location specific. You know, which is why you've got the Venice tune, you've got the Tibetan foothills with the skidoo, 
Um, so th there were tunes that were designed for very specific moments in the game. Um, and I was able to write a bit more of it as well. And wh what I was doing as well with Tomb Raider 2 was reducing the length of the cues um, because I found that three minutes was just too long yeah. in Tomb Raider 1. Um, you know, by the time the player had, had heard the whole tune, they'd, they'd walked into several different areas and the tune was no longer relevant. Yeah. You know, so it was better to have tunes that were 30 seconds, one minute long, this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how the musical direction was, was changing. And in Tomb Raider 3, again, the tunes were even more fragmented. I had some tunes that were just five or ten seconds long. Uh, so they were used for literally, you know, when something happened from around the corner, um, things like that. So I was starting to design the music so that it was more interactively friendly for me from an implementation point of view. Um, um, but still trying to keep the emotional content there. Um, and, and, and I think that's the thing that people really noticed as being different 